Hi, I am Sarah Wade and I am a Master Gardener in Rutherford County and today I'm going to talk to you about monarch butterflies. Monarch butterflies are something that a lot of gardeners want in their garden. In order to get them, you do need to understand just a few things. Um, you need to understand their migration pattern. You need to understand their life cycle. You need to understand that you need certain flowers. You need flowers that the adults can feed on, both the adults that are coming to your garden and the adults that you will raise. Um, you need a lot of milkweed for their babies and you need to not use um, pest control, fertilizer, those kind of things. And we're gonna talk about each of these items. So first let's talk about their migration patterns. This is a photo that I got from the US Fish and Wildlife Sur Service Department. And I think it's a great, um, you know, it, it shows it really, really wonderfully. Um, basically though, if you live west of the Rockies, the monarchs winter in California. If you live east of the Rockies, they monarch, they, your monarchs winter in Mexico. And there are some that overwinter in Florida, but they kind of stay in Florida. They don't travel too much outside of Florida. Um, but Tennessee being east of the Rockies, all of our monarchs travel to and from Mexico, which is quite a feat. And if you look in this map, they are kind of at the southern part of Mexico. So they, they travel a long, long way. They are tropical. Um, they like warm climates. They like warm weather. They um, overwinter in Mexico and then they head north. And once they get to Canada or really the northern United States, they turn around and do it all over again. Um, and this process happens every single year. So let's talk about their life cycle really quickly. Their life cycle, they start as eggs. They may, the male and the female will mate. The male will live about six to eight weeks and he will mate with several females. And then his job is done. <laughs> Sorry guys, uh, he will die after that. The female will lay her eggs. She has, she can lay several hundred eggs in her uh, short lifespan. She will only lay those eggs on milkweed. And so she does, uh, we don't really know exactly how they find the milkweed, but they do find it and that's where they'll, she'll lay them. Um, she will die after laying all of her eggs. And the eggs, as you can see in the photos, they are cream colored. Um, in person, they almost look like a pearl. They're kind of shiny. Um, they're a little bit oblong, kind of like a football on one end. Um, they're, really, they're really cool. They're really, really beautiful. How long it takes them to hatch does depend on the weather. I find the spring uh, monarchs really are a lot slower and the, fall, the summer ones go a lot faster. That does just take a couple days. They, once they hatch, they will eat their egg sac first. And then they all start eating the milkweed, which is why that's where the eggs are. <laughs> that's why the mother puts in there. It's because they start eating almost just immediately. And you can see from the photo on the right-hand side how tiny they are. That's my hand and it's, it's blown up. <laughs> so my head is not that big. So they are just itty, itty, bitty. But they'll start eating. And then they eat and they eat and they eat. They, the photo on the right is uh, one plant that a couple of them just devoured uh, within a day. Um, obviously, the bigger that they get, the more that they eat. As they grow, they shed their skin. Uh, you can see in the photo, there's an arrow pointing to the skin, and they will also eat that skin. Uh, and as they grow, they're called, it's called going into the next instar. There are five instars, um, and the bigger they get, the more pronounced their coloring gets and they obviously eat a lot more. Here's just some photos. So some people wonder the difference between a monarch and a swallowtail, and that's a really common confusion. When you look at them side by side, it's pretty easy to tell them apart. The one on the left is the monarch, and he has uh, his stripes. He's, he's yellow and black and white stripes, and the one on the right is a swallowtail, and he looks more almost like a speckled uh, yellow and black with the green striping. Um, the other thing, other way you can also tell is what plant are they on. A monarch is only going to be on milkweed, but a swallowtail will eat off of fennel, dill, parsley, celery, and other things in the carrot family. When it's eaten and it's gone into the instar number five, it is time to move to the next stage. They are quite big. Remember the photo on the left is when it was just hatched, and the photo on the right well, not, well, it is blown up just a little bit. They are quite big. Um, they you kind of are quite amazed that they grow as big as they do from as small as they start. 
it will go upside, it will migrate upwards, might not migrate, but it'll climb upwards and it'll find a good spot to hang. Um, obviously in this photo is an enclosure, but outside it'll be a tree or a leaf or anything like that. They will anchor themselves in, in a silk webbing that they create and they will hang upside down. And this is called the hanging J phase, or some people will just say that it's in J. Obviously it looks like the letter J. And they do have to hang upside down. They have to, in order for the whole thing to form correctly and for the wings to develop and all that, they have to be upside down. You can see in this photo too, if you look at the bottom of it, this part right here is greener. And that is because the chrysalis is actually inside of the caterpillar. Uh, when I grew up, everything was called a cocoon, and that's actually a little bit, um, there's, there's two. A cocoon is more like a moth will do where it spins the covering, kind of like a sleeping bag, around them. But the chrysalis actually is already inside of them, and they will shed this final layer of skin, and um, that's, that's the part of the chrysalis that, you, that you're seeing right there. And it takes about a day and then the fun begins. The caterpillar's um, antenna will look, I'm gonna uh, have a video here for you. And this is just one that I, that I was filming. And then I noticed that there was one right next to him that was going, it was shutting its skin. So I took a video for you. If you can see at the bottom, you see his, his, his antenna are squiggly and they're look kind of limp and he straightens himself out and then he will start to split his skin from the bottom. Um, the pointer is right there, showing you at the bottom. And I did speed up this video a little bit. It usually takes up about five to six minutes, but this one won't take that long. As he's shedding his skin, he's also pumping his body. And what he's doing is he's kind of, he's scrunching that skin all the way to the top, which is really his, the backside of him. But he's scrunching that skin all the way up to the top. He does look a little bumpy right now, but that will harden and smooth out like the chrysalis that you see on the left hand side. It takes a couple hours for it to do that. Once the skin is completely shed at the top, you will see him move around and he just kind of swirls around and then he's trying to knock that skin off of him and it'll just fall to the ground. They don't seem to like it <laughs> sitting on top of their chrysalis. So now he'll start rotating again just to knock that, that skin off. He does not need it anymore. There you go. All right, now the process is done. The chrysalis uh, looks like I said on, on the left hand side. It looks kind of bumpy, but it'll smooth out to look like the one on the right hand side. What I do love about the monarch chrysalis is these bands of gold on it. Um, at the bottom, they have these spots and they have this band across the front. I just think it's, it's just so pretty. And they can be this sea green color or they can be a little bit darker, um, this darker green like on the, on the left. Um, it doesn't seem to matter that much. I don't really know <laughs> what the difference is, but um, I just love the gold banding. I just think it's so pretty. The chrysalis is about the size of a quarter and it will harden over the next 24 hours. So if you were to raise them or if you were to um, 
you know, find one on the ground that has been knocked underground or whatever. You want to kind of make sure that it's hardened, that it's not fresh. Um, again, we want to make sure that chrysalis is very hard um, so that our sweet little monarch can form. And if you see right here, where you can see where my pointer is, these little marks right here, there's one, two, three, four, those are the air holes. There's some on the other side as well. So those are the air holes that allowing it to breathe. The chrysalis will sit for the next uh, 10 to 14 days. Again, it goes faster in the warmer weather. In the spring, it takes a little bit longer. And then, of course, inside, it's completely rearranging itself. And the older that the chrysalis gets, it dark, the darker that it becomes. And it's actually not becoming darker. It's becoming clear. And the darkness that you see is, is all the black of the butterfly. You first see the wings develop. You'll first see that little bit of um, orange. Um, but you'll mostly see, you'll see the orange, and then you'll see the black. And again, that's just the clear, the chrysalis is becoming clear. Then it starts to emerge and it's going to break out. See how the chrysalis is clear? It still does have the goal that, is, that never really goes away, but it's, it's clear. It does come out head first. It's all spotted. It's just, it's just really beautiful. And then he comes out and his wings are folded up. And gravity, this is why they also have to hang upside down, is because gravity uh, needs to pull those wings out, like in this third photo. And the wings are wet, and so he just needs to hang there. For, and he'll hang there for about a couple hours, an hour or two, depending on the weather. And those wings will dry out. And he's while he's and while the wings are drying out, he's also uh, doing all sorts of things with his mouth and his body, pumping it, and uh, just doing. It's really cool. You can look it up. Just there's just doing a lot of different things to. Like I said it's become a whole new creature, so it's it's just making it all work. Now the difference between a male and a female. There are ways to determine it, but the easiest way to do it is just to look at the outside of their wings. The male will have the two black dots on his, um, the lower part of his wings, like in this photo, and the female does not have that. That's just the easiest way to tell. So then the process starts all over again. There are four generations throughout the year. The first generation hatches in March or April. Remember, those are the ones that are coming from Mexico. The second, gener the second and third generation hatch from May to August. And each generation goes through that same phase. And they have an average lifespan of only about four to six weeks. But the fourth generation is special and they are called the super monarchs. They are born in September and October and they can live for six to eight months. So remember the previous ones only live four to six weeks. These super monarchs live six to eight months. And they are the ones that will migrate south back to Mexico. They actually overwinter in Trees, you can look up online. It's really, really cool to see all these monarchs sleeping in these trees. They're kind of semi-dormant and they will conserve their energy for the winter. And then in May, uh, March and April, they'll wake up, they'll go search for a mate, and then they'll lay their eggs. And then um, these will die off, the, then the eggs with the new generation, and the whole process starts all over again. Here's another um, part that I found on Journey North, which is a company that um, kind of helps monitor migrations of all different um, creatures and I thought this is a really great one. So you'll see that the breeding begins March, April, first generation, um, they start to head north, second generation is born around June, third around July, fourth generation around August. And then they do have the fall breeding. Um, some monarchs breed in the south beginning in August. Assuming they are the fourth generation monarchs from the north, their offspring are actually the fifth generation. Um, so it's just a really cool process that they go through every single year. So I guess in the beginning, what can you do to have monarchs in their, in your yard? You need to understand their migration pattern. You are only probably going to see them twice a year, once in the spring, once in the fall. Um, in the year 2020, I had them in my garden in April, and then I had them again in the, at, the, at the end of August. So some people will say, it's June, I haven't seen any monarchs. Well, you're not going to, because, at least not in Tennessee, because they're migrating. So knowing when to look for them is when they're going to be in your yard. You need to understand their life cycle. What stage are they at in their life cycle? Are they are there babies right now? Are they um, full grown adults? That's important to notice. Um, you need to have flowers that the adults can feed on. The adult female is obviously going to be attracted for the milkweed, but she doesn't feed on milkweed. She feeds on zinnia, butterfly bush, salvia, um, all those really good butterfly pollinator type plants. So you need to make sure you have those so that she can eat or, and, or the male can eat. But also once your babies grow up, they need to eat as well. Because again, they don't eat, they only eat the monarch, they only eat the milkweed as when they are a caterpillar. 
so they need actual nectar when they are adults. But you do need the milkweed for those babies. They eat a lot. <laughs> I always say that they could rival any teenage boy. They eat a lot of milkweed. And so this is not something that um, I personally think that one plant kind of covers it. You need to have several so that they can have a lot of food. And you need to not use your pest control, the weed control, fertilizers, those kind of things. Monarchs are actually very, very sensitive and they can get a lot of diseases um, from those products. If you do feel that you have to use those products in your yard, then I would maybe do it like in the dead of the winter, <laughs> you know, like in the December, January, those February types of things where they're not present. Um, but any time that it's during, during their season, I, would, I personally would not use any of those controls just because you might end up doing more harm than good. And that's it. I hope you ever enjoyed the presentation on Monarchs. I hope you learned a few things. If you have any questions, I am happy to try to answer them. And thank you so much.